Now, the Adventure 28 is principally a day cruiser, what they like to call the ultimate day cruiser. And the test boat we have here today, the Arxon 30, they're describing as the ultimate weekender. There's a tremendous amount to talk about with this boat, so I'm really excited to get on board and have a closer look at what they mean. And the boat's been performing extremely well. And with that fine entry, the re-entry is very, very soft and easy. So it's really quite a comfortable and easy boat. So actually, I know I always do this, but before we jump on board, there's a couple of extra bits we really need to have a look at. I mean, firstly, there's the colours which are pretty cool. That 28, that's jungle green. Here we have arctic grey and there's also a, uh, a desert yellow which kind of tells you everything you need to know about uh, the kind of adventure principles that underpin this new range. Also, right here, I mean, if you look at the standard Exo Explorer 10 upon which this boat is based, you'll see that they use a kind of standard, quite thick, but standard uh, rubber rubbing straight which is relatively heavy it wraps around the boat here they've swapped that for a much larger diameter uh, chunk of foam which is actually lighter in weight and it also gives you a bit of uh, extra uh, impact mitigation and because they've designed it that way you can also despite the fact we have a full beam pilot house use this as a proper side deck and the final thing to talk about before we actually jump on board is the hull now, in standard fit out as the XO10, uh, this is a category C boat for 10 people. Uh, it's very heavily built. It's a, a finished built aluminium hull. It's got eight millimeter aluminium at the keel, uh, six on the bottom, five millimeter on the sides. Uh, and they've, they've stayed with that, that same level of plating. But what they've done, or certainly what they're gonna do on the production boats, is reinforce it on the inside. So they can turn this into a category B boat for six or C for 10. Now that we're actually getting on board the boat, the first thing you notice is how easy that is. We've got uh, swim platforms extending aft on both sides, plus twin gates again on both sides to get into this symmetrical cockpit. We also have the shore power out the back there, out of the way. Um, and here on this particular boat, we have a single Suzuki 350 with the dual props, which, you know, dual props is fantastic if you've got a, a single engine boat. Uh, you can also have this boat with twin 250s. That tends to be what they recommend. That will give you about 50 knots. Apparently this is good for around about 38 to 40. Um, and they're also actually experimenting with twin diesel 200 horsepower outboards for 2023. So it'll be interesting to see what comes of that. But as regards the cockpit itself, once you get in here, you notice it's got, it's got quite practical kind of fishing touches. We've got these uh, fold down seats on three sides and each of them comes obviously with a cushion that you need to stow elsewhere. There's no room for that here. And those cushions themselves, as you can see, they're self-draining cushions, waterproof over the top, but self-draining. So the idea is that in the long term, they don't become fusty and mouldy if you happen to leave them out accidentally in the rain or drop them overboard in the salt water. Now of course because these seats are fold-up seats it means you can keep the cockpit area nice and open for various bits of water sports kit and toys if you want it or to do a bit of fishing so that is very practical but what it also means is the fact that you've got no uh, moulded seat bases so no storage in this cockpit so quite naturally I've had a little bit of a route about looking for alternative ways to store your bits and bobs you inevitably take on a, a week away or even just a weekend away and if I fold this up and open these spaces you'll see that the under deck spaces they don't really take up the slack for that at all we've got a water tank here on the starboard side uh, we've got the fuel tank I think on this boat actually we've got uh, twin 225 litre fuel tanks and they're directly beneath this section of deck here so there's room for you know lines or perhaps a fender but little more than that and on the other side over here 
we're pretty much storing the battery. So storage is not a particularly major strength back here. But what is, is versatility. And in addition to these seats, we also have an extended table. It's bigger than on the uh, XO10. Uh, that's currently inside in the Danette. They're going to fit that with two legs, so you can pop that out in the centre of this deck. And the principle is you can turn this entire area into a third double bed for guests. So you can have two in the forward cabin, two in the uh, pilot house, another two aft. And then you can spec it with an all over tent that wraps right around here, back there to the transom. So you can genuinely sleep six people on a 30 foot platform, which is a, a really nice little touch. So what else do we have in this cockpit? Well, at the back end here, aside from the uh, safety gear, we have a fender basket currently, and they're looking at turning this into a bike rack so you can keep them out of the way back here. We also have a roof rack up on the top of the pilot house there. That takes some of the uh, weight out of the lack of storage back here. We've uh, got a life raft there, but again, that's plenty big enough for your uh, sea kayaks, your paddle boards, or your bikes as well. Down on the deck, we've got something equally practical. This is a uh, S-Tech deck, and uh, it comes, it's different because it comes with kind of a fiberglass backing, uh, which makes it much easier and more reliable to fit, and it means that uh, you don't get any of those little bubbles or ripples or imperfections. It's uh, very smooth, beautifully done, and it's extremely grippy, even when it's wet. On the back end here of the pilot house itself, we've got a uh, sliding patio door. Uh, giving you access to the uh, compact uh, wet bar galley just there. At the moment that doesn't entirely slide to starboard. It'd be good if you could slide both panels to starboard so you could open up that port donnet in the pilot house to the uh, dining areas further aft and that'd be particularly good if you could get two tables, one for each, because then you could basically have six people dining here, four in there. That's ten people on a 30-foot boat. Again, very impressive. But the other thing I wanted to mention, and I absolutely forgot before I jumped on board, I told you there's a lot to talk about, is over here, below this uh, kind of uh, foam side deck uh, that Arkson's created, we have an additional foam section that runs along the side of the hole here. And as you can see, it, it sits right down here at kind of pontoon level, so it's very useful um, to do the work of fenders with a bit of knockabout boating, kind of protects your hull, gives you a bit of confidence. Um, but also, if we take a, a little look back here at uh, the boat behind us, which I think is a, an Axapar, we'll see that the conventional kind of uh, solution for that is to have your primary rubbing strake high and then a, a secondary rubbing strake further down, which kind of moves perhaps a quarter, a third of the way forward on the hull. So this is a different solution. It doesn't protect the back ends of your swim platforms as the more conventional solution does, but critically, Given that this boat is based on the XO10, it distinguishes it aesthetically from that boat. And that's an important part of this Arkson package. When you step into the pilot house and that aft deck, well, you can tell from the profile, it's got very low profile kind of stance, this boat. It's quite low slung. So you have to drop down into that saloon. It's a good sort of uh, foot lower than the aft deck, in fact. But headroom in here is pretty good, despite that low profile kind of uh, aesthetic. And you're immediately greeted by a, uh, a compact galley, and more like a, a, well, kind of a wet bar in its own way. If we lift this lid up, you'll see what I mean. It doesn't actually have any kind of cooking facilities, but what it does have is a slot for a camping stove, a little gas camping stove you can fit in there. And if you're not using it as that, it's just a handy little storage spot. Also have an additional storage spot for small items like phones and keys just there and a really decent size of sink. A fairly decent work surface too, nicely done in um, proper timber. Um, and down below here we have another couple of compact storage spaces, plus little touches that you don't find on the original XO10 model, like these uh, kind of leather uh, grabbing points on these grab rails. And if we look up top we've got additional grab rails, again leather lined up around the top, so you can move around this boat when it's uh, doing a decent kind of pace. 
The space in here is good though, and you'd expect that because of course it uses pretty much the full beam for this pilot house. You know there are various models in the uh, EXO fleet, some of which I genuinely love, that use a narrower pilot house with a walk around configuration, but this has chosen to use a central companionway on a kind of dog leg to take you all the way through and up onto that bow or down into that forward cabin. And when you step in here, much as I love a walk around configuration, this kind of works, particularly because those foam sections on either side give you quite a natural sort of cheat side deck anyway. So if we look over to the port side, this is pretty much what you'd expect in terms of the configuration, but it does differ from the XO10. On the XO10, we've got an L-shaped seating section with a compact table. And here, they've changed that up to use a bigger table. That's partly, of course, because they want it to be big enough so they can use it on that aft deck as an infill and create that, you know, uh, additional, that third double bed for people who are happy to camp back there. Uh, but it works pretty well, I have to say. The front seat, with a very simple mechanism down here, a kind of spring-loaded lever, you can ease that open swing it back halfway and then face aft and this is plenty big enough for four people uh, to sit and dine. As I say we've already got six person diner back in that aft cockpit. The helm seat itself that doesn't rotate to face us but you don't really need that we've already got dining for ten and in any case that's already a very complicated bit of kit that helm seat because it's heated uh, and it's got uh, impact mitigation built into the, the base of the unit there. So it's already pretty impressive. They're looking at making it rotate, but they need to make sure that it doesn't exceed around about 20 centimetres in height, height at the, the base there, because they need it obviously to retain good visibility through these uh, wraparound windows. And then, of course, if we pull this lever again, we can swing this, so that's the theory anyway, let's shift that cushion forward and give that some welly. Yeah, we can drop that in there, remove this, uh, post beneath the table. As I say, that will be two posts in the future to make it a bit more rigid because at the moment it wobbles a touch. Plus that uh, extra post, those two posts will be much more stable when you use it as a, an infill aft. You drop that table in and there are infill cushions that you can put on board there. So that's uh, another of your double guest beds. So that's a nice touch. Now what else do we have in here? Well, we have a very large sunroof directly above the helm. That's quite welcome. At the moment this is manually operated. Um, on production boats I'm told it will be electrically operated. Uh, but in terms of storage in here, which is again something I'm looking at because we lack it on that uh, aft deck. <clears throat> well if we look beneath these seats, there's a decent amount of room, particularly beneath the aft bench, to slot things under there. And I thought perhaps that was designed by Arxon to be a kind of quick grab um, point for, for the gear that you kind of need to hand. But they're actually looking into creating uh, an underseat kind of pull-out drawer. If the customer specs the air conditioning unit on this boat, then that will go in there, so that will limit the storage there. But there is decent space beneath these seats, even though it hasn't yet been properly used. Now it's quite impressive that just further ahead, if I put this seat back the way it was, there we are. Let's get it up there. That's better. We have space for a separate heads compartment to port. Now I'm going to climb into there. Realistically, I'm about six foot. The only way to get in here properly, because it kind of fouls on the helm console there, is to slide yourself backwards as though you go down a ladder pop yourself in here. Now it will come with a sink and a shower fitting apparently on production boats, it doesn't quite yet, but it does have the toilet fitted. There are no windows other than a bit of a skylight above, but in all honesty that skylight is more kind of a an alcove, like a recess for my hair than anything else because headroom is uh, obviously quite compact in here. But you can see the kind of intentions with this thing as an adventure boat. I mean, we've got life-saving signals, a bit of reading matter on the back of the uh, door so you can uh, swat up in case of emergency when you're visiting the loo. Now, as we move further forward, I finally find what it is I've been looking for, which is kind of the marine equivalent of a man drawer. You know, that, that place where you just stick all the stuff that's cluttering up your mind and cluttering up your house so you can make it look as though you've got everything well organized. And as you might expect, it's a bit of a mess in here because that's exactly how they've used it. But it's a good space, a really good space. It's got a kind of 
uh, fabric partition rather than the rigid door. So you can fit bulky items in here that you might not otherwise be able to stick in here with um, if the door was solid. We also got good access to the wiring on the back of the dash equipment, so that's a nice touch. And there are a couple of equally nice touches as we move further forward beneath this foredeck. Now we have the primary weekending cabin here, obviously a V-berth, um, reasonably well elevated. So there's not a great deal of headroom, so it's quite cool that the hatch slides right the way forward. So you can sit in this space without hitting your head on this relatively low uh, foredeck. But what I really like is the way you can access that foredeck from down here without having to climb or struggle. Um, now I've tried to operate this three or four times in my slightly ham-fisted fashion and failed, so forgive me if I don't do it properly, it's not the device, it's entirely me. It's kind of a hockey stick shaped guide, so you can swing it up and into place. And that enables you to climb straight up and out onto that foredeck, no problem at all, without risking hitting your head on any uh, fiberglass edges. And what does slightly aggravate me, of course, as I've intimated before, is the fact that these cushions, lovely though they are, for the uh, seats on that aft deck, there's nowhere specific to stow them. I've tried to stow the uh, long one in this space beneath the dash, but uh, it doesn't quite fit, and I don't want to uh, start interfering with the cabling by knocking that stuff. Uh, so it kind of hangs around in here, annoying me slightly. But, if I pop this away, that was expertly done get the cushion back in. The bed in here is actually pretty decent. If I shuffle myself backwards into this space, on the face of it, it seems relatively short fore and aft, but we've got these quite deep recesses go back another foot and a half on either side. So if I put my head right up here, I've got a good space at my feet. In fact, I'll show you better if I put my feet down at the bottom. I'm six foot and I reckon, yeah, we've got a good, a good foot above my head before you reach this little bit of lining where well, there's some excellent storage behind here big enough as you can see for a camping mat and plenty besides we've also got <coughs> little shelving units on both sides here there are no windows in here but of course this is a prototype model so Arxon and Exo need to work out ways in which they can make that sort of thing happen so I think maybe in the next year or two as uh, the development process really kicks in and the production models become more refined you might see that factored into the equation but in terms of its capacity to sleep you comfortably, it's pretty good, not least because, unlike the XO10, we've got a, a fabric lining on the top here and the sides, which obviously when you're sleeping in here, you tend, if you've got hard surfaces, to gather a little bit of uh, moisture. You get a few drips, a bit of clamminess, so this uh, sorts that out and makes it feel like a much more comfortable night's sleep. Well, we've had a thoroughly good play with this boat in some fairly snotty solent conditions. Um, nasty, short, steep, chop, the sort of conditions that uh, solent boaters know well. And the boat's been performing extremely well. There's, there's plenty I want to say about the, uh, the helm position, um, but I'm not going to do that out here while we're getting knocked about a bit. Uh, we'll do that when we're back in flatter water. What we'll do now is we'll get her back up to speed so we can have a little chat about how she handles that. So put the hammers down. And there's a decent bit of bow rise as you're coming up onto the plane. It suggests there's a, a decent bit of weight aft. But then she flattens right off. And I've got the, uh, the tabs nicely set to keep our, uh, the port side of the, uh, the boat elevated a little in this uh, slightly lumpy beam seat. But the key thing about this boat, with the various doors and hatches shut, is that she's quiet. And when you get it a little wrong and come down off a, a crest heavily, even into the face of the, uh, the next crest, there's a degree of softness from those uh, fine hull angles. This is a 24 degree dead rise, but we also have pretty fine entry forward as well, and that uh, is very forgiving. Then, of course, if you really want to ease back on the impacts, you could just sit yourself on the impact mitigation seat, which takes, yeah, another 40 or 50 percent out of those impacts so it's really quite a comfortable and easy boat there's not much of a bow flare here so it can seem like a slightly wet boat when you've got some uh, big swells some messy swells around you 
and you see a bit of uh, a decent bit of water hitting the, the windscreen. But of course, it's a pilot house boat. It's drying, it's comfortable, it's not a problem. So if we now turn away from that beam sea and head down the seas a little bit, this boat is pretty much in its element with that. And it's not a, it's not a, a quick, witted, agile thing to necessarily surf down the faces of those swells, but it's certainly very forgiving. As I say, it's very easy to elevate that nose without that uh, dual prop losing grip. And with that fine entry, the re-entry is very, very soft and easy. It's not a problem at all. We're doing about 23 knots down these seas, but we could easily increase that to 30 or so. I won't do so because, um, because of course, Paul has to be able to hold the camera and film as we're running along here. But what's equally interesting is the fact that this seems to have the credentials for quite a decent cruising boat too. We've got 225 litre tanks, a pair of those, that's 450 litres. Uh, so a usable amount of around about 360 litres, you'd have thought, with a decent uh, bit of redundancy in the system. And if we're running at 30 knots, we're drinking about 60 litres per hour, which is of course around about 2 litres per nautical mile, which is exactly where you want this kind of boat to be. That's pretty good performance from that uh, single 350. But it seems to me that Arkson kind of recommend the twin 250s and I would agree with them about that. Because when you're heading into a, uh, a short choppy head sea and you're doing your, your 30, 32 knots, you know that your top end's around about 36, 37 with this boat. And with that extra grunt, I reckon it would be a more comfortable sort of passage into a, a choppy head sea because you could up the pace a little bit, sit yourself a little bit more on the crest of those waves and show that fine entry to the, the swells that are coming your way instead of flirting a little bit too much with the troughs and getting yourself a little bit up and down. Well, you've just uh, nipped out of the main channel and found a little bit of uh, quieter water. So we'll settle down here now and uh, just have a little chat about the ergonomics of this helm station. <clears throat> now, first and foremost, this is a magnificent seat. It's tremendously comfortable. There is no fore and aft adjustment on this as things stand, though they're currently working to uh, make that happen. So with my body shape, when I've, I've jammed it back in here and the seas are rough and I'm enjoying that uh, impact mitigation, I find myself reaching a little for the wheel, finding everything just a tiny bit remote, so it'd be nice to shift it forward. I know there's uh, um, capacity mechanically when you're alongside to shift that seat and retighten the screws, but obviously if there's uh, more than one person expecting to helm it, then some sort of on the hoof adjustability would be useful. Something that's also worth mentioning are the trim tabs. Now on this boat, uh, in this configuration, we got them rigged here right next to the MFD. Now, I prefer to see the Suzuki engine display up there next to the MFD, so you, at a glance you can get all the data you need uh, in one go. Then shift those trim tabs down here closer to your throttle hand, which of course is the hand you use to operate them. And in terms of the way they operate on this particular boat, they're not very intuitive. Um, as things stand, if for instance you've got your, your starboard side low, you would conventionally press the port side down to drop the port side of the bow to drop the, the left hand side but of course here on this boat the way they're labeled that refers in fact to the position of the tabs not to the position of your bow so it's counterintuitive for me a little bit um, you get used to it of course but it uh, does take uh, you know 10 15 minutes to get used to that because on most boats of course it's it's not done that way um, elsewhere the angles of some of the dash equipment does invite a little bit of glare from the uh, overhead sunroof. And at the moment, because this is basically a prototype, boat number one, there's no dash top uh, compass. What we have at the moment is a, a portable compass down below, but on production models, of course, that will be sorted out. And then there's the uh, wraparound screens. From this sitting position, visibility is very good. When you heel her into a turn, there's plenty of heel in that turn, so this big sunroof helps to see to the port side. And visibility, again, pretty decent to the starboard side because you, of course, just dip your head. What we also have, though, is a little fold-down foot brace here, which you use when you're, you're sitting down. But it also means, I just shift this open, that you can stand on that while you're at the helm and you can have a good look over the top, communicate with people, and that's particularly useful 
because we don't have any kind of uh, sliding window to open here if you need to communicate with people on other boats or on the pontoon. So that's quite a, a handy touch. So if I get myself back down inside the boat here and get rid of this step, there's a simple pull pin device and up it goes. Stand myself in this position and use the bolster. It's a relatively low slung boat as I mentioned, so the mouldings are relatively close to the horizon. Also, because there's no uh, fore and aft adjustability uh, in this seat at the moment, uh, I'm quite close to these mouldings on the, uh, the helm console. So my feet are jamming against this, and I'd like a little bit more space if possible, just to feel really comfortable there. Um, also, the windscreen wiper cleans, because it's a curved screen, it cleans about sort of a, a 10 inch strip rather than um, anything particularly useful when you're covering the screen with uh, salt water. But you know, look, if the ergonomics of this boat are not yet perfect, that's perfectly understandable. It is, after all, a prototype. It's boat number one. Um, and future production models are likely to be a great deal more refined in that regard and in several other regards too. Uh, but what this boat is, is a serious all-weather plaything that will keep you safe. It's not it's not necessarily a, a boat to take out and expect quick-witted reactions from your yeah, helm input. It's, it's, it feels quite big, it feels quite heavy, it feels very tough and stoic. So it's absolutely a boat that will look after you. Now this is already a very impressive boat in a lot of ways, but actually as the prototype, as number one boat, the first Arxon 30, it was basically imported into the UK uh, from EXO by Arxon and then kind of retrofitted in accordance with the spec that they expect the production models um, to use. Uh, so although it already feels relatively high spec, it's not quite there yet. I mean, uh, the list of things it, it currently lacks is quite extensive. There's the share and sink for the head compartment, there's the anchor windlass, there's the diesel heating, uh, a transom shower, the extra table leg here so you can rig it aft in that uh, cockpit, there's saloon mood lighting, we've got a couple of quite lively strips up here that give you quite bright light, but there'll also be recessed mood lighting to give you an amb ambient glow from around the, the corners here, around the edges of the pilot house. Uh, there'll also be the electric sunroof and a dash mounted compass. And then of course because production models will of course be made to arcs and spec by EXO in EXO's factory, production models will also be more refined, they'll be better finished. Uh, elements like the slight gap uh, that's been filled in um, where the, uh, the, the fender's been rigged around the periphery of the boat here. And that'll be cleaned up, but much slicker, much cleaner. Now the first production model will be available in January 2023 and that'll be appearing at the Dusseldorf International Boat Show. But with uprated finish, uprated equipment and uprated ergonomics, it will be very easy, I think, to see why it has that base package price of around £350,000 including VAT.